the last part again for this semester. So as me, today we are very honored to have Dr. Lee Wen King talk to us about something more fun, I would say. So, without um, further ado, yeah. <laughs> Because normally I'm in front of you guys talking about physics, right? Tutorial and stuff. But uh, today I'm only I'm mainly here to talk to you guys as a writer. And uh, also this talk, right? Uh, let me get this out of the way. I to tell, explain what this talk is not about. It is not about the like the physics of Star Trek right? or physics of lightsaber that kind of thing. Uh, because you guys will know more about this than me. So what I'm trying, what I'm here to tell you about is like how. Uh, literature, uh, in particular science fiction literature, overlaps with the scientific community. So these two things have more in common with each other than most people expect. And also I will show you um, how actually actual writers and actual scientists, not only, sometimes they are the same person, but they also cooperate with each other to work on various projects. So the most obvious one is, I guess, uh, the recent movie, right, Interstellar. I will talk more about this later, uh, proceed to complain. But, uh, yeah, so let's get into it, right? So firstly, let us uh, define what I will be talking about. So, uh, what I will say actually will apply to beyond science fiction as well, just literature in general. But, uh, you know, science fiction, if we follow the definition, a lot of people will disagree what is or isn't science fiction. So we will pick one and stick with it for the moment, right? So, uh, the genre of science fiction is is something where the setting differs from our own world and it is based from extrapolations made from one or more changes. So, uh, for example, right, interstellar, we, space travel is possible through wormholes, for example. Star Trek, uh, teleportation is possible and things like that. So, Star Wars, we have lightsabers. And um, <clears throat> now, these changes cannot be anything. This is mainly to distinguish from another genre uh, of fantasy, which is uh, the difference can be explained through uh, scientific means. So uh, there is a distinction, not to say, you know, uh, who, what is better or another, just that there are different groups to separate from, let's say, Lord of the Rings or Dark Souls, you know, Harry Potter, things like that, right? So uh, for those things, we have magic and dragons and things, and, mo and also also for this case, science fiction is the a lot of things are based on science or technology. So as that's why we see that for science fiction, right, a lot of it takes place in the future. For fantasy, a lot of things takes place in the past. Okay, so so how is science fiction? What does science fiction have in common with uh, science? Right. Uh, I will focus mostly on theoretical physics, uh, theoretical physics, and because that's what I do. So, how does science fiction work, and how does a writer come up with a science fiction story? So, usually, we come. Uh, a story starts from some idea, right? Uh, before we have thought of characters, right? We have some idea, and uh, this is where uh, the setting takes place, right? And also. To, in order to have a story, we need to have some kind of cause and effect taking place within the story, right? So that's why at the beginning of movies or the first few chapters of the book or the starting levels of the game, we have what we writers call world building. We have to establish the setting first, right? That's why, uh, <clears throat> yeah, Lord of the Rings, right? The very first scene is a monologue to explain what happened. And for Star Wars, there's a classic opening crawl, right? The Trade Federation, blah, 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 things like that. So this is the world building. It tells us what is or is not possible. So uh, that is important in order for the plot to work because the plot and the story are the interactions between the characters and ideas within the world, right? So uh, in terms, so as scientists and physicists, right, the this type of thinking is something what we normally call thought experiments. So the science fiction stories usually start with a question, what if, right? So what if space travel is possible? What if time travel is possible? And so on and so forth. And then uh, once we have the settings, there's no story yet. We have to come up with a story. So the writers will put in characters 
and the characters will interact or evolve and we see what happens next right so that is the story so I was saying uh, a lot of things have overlap with science so this is the no <clears throat> the model that usually is the way we think about physics right or science or theoretical physics which is basically the same thing right uh, <clears throat> So, as we, the way we think about theoretical physics, physics is that you know every area of physics we have some kind. It always starts from some set of postulates, right? Uh, Newton's three laws, the postulates of quantum mechanics, the four laws of thermodynamics. So that is the analog to world building, and then uh, that's why these postulates establishes the worlds and ideas. And the characters and the story and how they interact is analogous to our variables of the theory, right? If you're talking about Maxwell's equation, uh, we ask the question, how does the electric or magnetic field uh, evolve, right, over time? Or Newton's laws, right, uh, F equals to ma, so the particle position, how do they change over time? So the thinking is similar, right? You have the setting, the laws, and what is or isn't possible, we have the variables, and then we let them go, we evolve, and we see how they propagate. So the way of thinking is uh, very similar. That's uh, uh, yeah. So that's the idea behind this. And since we, and because you know the paradigm of physics or theoretical physics is very similar to writing. Most very often the scientists are writers and writers are scientists. So that's why there's a lot of overlap between this discipline. So perhaps the most famous one is Isaac Asimov. He started off as a scientist, and he's actual he's actually a professor uh, for biochemistry, and he wrote biochemistry textbook as well as uh, science fiction book as well. So if you have not heard of him, right, he is famous for mainly two series: the Foundation series and the Robot series. So yeah, so this one, uh, his science fiction story has nothing to do with biochemistry. Foundation is the story where it takes place in the future. 50,000 years in the future where humans can space travel already. So humans have traveled to different planets and things like that. So humans are able to establish big empires. And the idea for the foundation, that is the setting, right? And what is the what is the story, the plot, the evolution is that, well, if we are able to set up large empires, right, what's gonna happen? So we know from history, most of the time, whenever we have big empires, uh, more often than not, they will fail, they will fall, right? Uh, Roman Empire, Maya civilization, and uh, many others, right? Egyptians, and so on. So, and if we learn from history, his foundation story takes place, uh, takes a lot of inspiration from history. So, in history, the reason why they fail is mostly for economic reasons, or societal reasons, or all those things. So, he applied this to the scale of space travel, but that's not the science fiction idea yet. So the science fiction idea is that in the future, suppose that there is someone has developed a theoretical model to predict future uh, evolutions of civilization, then uh, what can we do with it? So can we prevent the collapse of civilization? So that is the foundation that, uh, that, that uh, Isimov was talking about. Then his second most uh, his other famous story is the robot series, which is just stories about robots. Very simple. Uh, but his main idea, his main contribution is that uh, suppose that if we were to design robots, right? Of course, every time we come up with technology, we have to implement some safety measure. So we have to prevent a robot uprising to that, to avoid them enslaving the humans, right? So. The idea is that if humans want to build robots, we implement the three, every robot must follow the three laws of robotics. Right, so uh, robot must uh, obey commands of human, must uh, uh, must obey, the, must preserve itself, but the priority is human. So it must take measures to protect itself, but if the measure contradicts with harming humans, then the human, the robot will choose to harm itself rather than the human. And will that sustain a possible uh, society that coexists with robots or not? So that is his uh, robot story, right? Uh, <clears throat> so the next thing is um, 
uh, Arthur C. Clarke. So Arthur C. Clarke is uh, not a scientist, but in, within the STEM area, he used to work as a radar engineer in the 1950s. And during the 50s was the space age, right? During is the space race with Russia. So the space industry was booming at that time. And he was one of the earliest few people who developed the idea of the geostationary satellites. So we have satellites that which the orbital period which it exactly equals to that of the Earth, so that it can stay on above the same spot on Earth at all times. And his contribution to science fiction is the Space Odyssey series. That is probably the most famous one. The classic film by Kubrick, right, 2001 Space Odyssey from 1963 is about... Uh, the idea for Space Odyssey is that suppose... Uh, what if our evolution of our species was actually controlled by aliens? And, uh, it, and uh, aliens will find a way to communicate with us and how and they will try to influence the our evolution. So that sounds a bit similar to Interstellar, right? And that is where Interstellar took a lot of ideas from. So um, more modern uh, people are people like Jana Levin. So she is still a prof at uh, NYU. And uh, I know about this person because uh, that she works in the same research area as me, like black holes and uh, celestial mechanics. So she wrote a novel called Mad Men Dreams of Curing Machine and it's the, about the life of... It is a historical fiction novel about Alan Turing. So Alan Turing is uh, one of the uh, fathers of modern computing. Right? So there are <coughs> uh, other people like Clifford Johnson, uh, string theorist, writing a graphic novel, science fiction. And uh, this one is a bit more productive. Fred Hoyle is one of the main contributors in cosmology. And uh, one of the few, uh, one of the earlier people who developed the Big Bang Theory, so the name Big Bang Theory came from him. Although he introduced Big Bang, the word Big Bang as a form of pejorative because I believe the story goes that he did not really believe in it, but he did contribute to it. And uh, his writing works, uh, novels, and a TV series. So uh, we do not know much about this because he wasn't uh, very famous for today. So, uh, I was saying, right, right uh, sometimes writers are scientists and scientists are writers, but even though they're not, they also cooperate with each other. So, in Hollywood, there is an organization called Science and Entertainment Exchange, S-E-E-X. So, uh, yeah, sex with two E's. So, they are... So what they do is, they, it is a platform for writers, mainly Hollywood writers, to interact with scientists and they can, they can find uh, working scientists to consult on scripts, working, uh, yeah, consult on scripts if whatever stories the writers are writing requires some knowledge of science so they can uh, consult with uh, this organization and they can uh, assign uh, different things to different people, right? So they can help develop uh, scientific theories because uh, for scientists who are, for writers who are not familiar with science and things like that, then they can ask actual physicists. So they have a lot of projects that we are probably familiar with now. The Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, uh, goes through this. So uh, physicists like Sean Carroll and Clifford Johnson, whose picture we seen earlier, uh, provided uh, help with that as well. So now, right? Why do organizations like this exist, and uh, why do scientists want to talk to uh, sci why why do writers want to talk to scientists and vice versa? The reason why is because they do have common goals, right? There is a reason why scientists want to get involved in presenting science accurately in stories and in Hollywood especially. And also writers have their own reasons on why they want to present things accurately. <coughs> so from the scientist's perspective, right, uh, I guess the reasons are obvious because our job is to educate the public. And of course, we want to present accurate information to the public as much as possible. So, uh, so for, uh, for, and not just the factual information. That's actually not really the most important part, but uh, the portrayal of scientists or, or the 
scientific thinking, right? Skepticism and uh, things like that. Of course, these things are important because it uh, influences public policy and things like that, right? So, for example, anti-vaccination. Right? So, people are spreading the myth that vaccines causes autism, blah, blah, blah. And uh, that is not true. So, uh, we, want to, uh, we want to fix that. And also, uh, another thing is more on the social side. Like, for example, uh, science, a lot of scientific communities, right? Uh, we have problems like sexism and racism and things like that. And every time, it's always majority guys who are physicists, physicists and things like that. And uh, young girls and young women are discouraged from applying or participating in STEM jobs. So, so, so how do, the, how do we help through here is that um, we will help in creating characters and scientists which can be role models to young people. So uh, let's say, uh, you know, it helps for young kids to see people who are like them and for them to see that they can be scientists in the future. They can grow up and it is a viable opportunity for them. So that's why, uh, you know, it's always, maybe on online, right, we always see, like, it's always a celebration when <coughs> When we, we have an action hero that is uh, that is a woman or a minority race or minority gender and things like that. Same for being a scientist. And yeah, so that is from the sci scientist point of view, right? So why do writers want to uh, consult so much with science in writing their stories? Is because uh, when things are too unrealistic or too crazy, they disengage audience right they detach us from the story so uh, this quote is the best way to describe uh, this one is by Mohan Pamuk Turkish writer Nobel laureate for literature so what he says is that uh, you know when you write something right the intimacy and confidence that develop between the writers and ourselves help us to not worry too much about the past that do not that we do not, the, the readers do not understand. He was referring mostly to novels, but it applies to uh, movies as well. For example, if we can, if when writing a story, right, when presenting as the movie goes along, if we can, if the audience gets the impression that the writer knows what they're doing, then uh, whatever plot holes or weird stuff happening, we can accept them. So uh, something like suspension of disbelief. So uh, that is quite important because when when we are writing stories, right, we want to know what are the stakes, like what is the risk if the hero fails, or that is the source of excitement and the source of tension, right? So if we do not know, so if things are if ridiculous things are happening, then if if not consciously, then subconsciously, we sort of know that. Okay, the writer is making things up as he goes along, and uh, and so that we are no longer that involved in the story anymore. We are no longer invested in the character anymore. So this is why Pixar is one of the most successful companies because they always come up with consistently good stories. And uh, back in twenty twelve or twenty thirteen, right? Uh, this person, uh, Pixar storyboard artist, published a series of tweets. Uh, which I think now we call it 22 rules of storytelling. So this is number 16. What are the stakes? Which is basically what I was talking about just now. So uh, we need to know, right? What are the consequences if our hero fails? So we need to uh, get. Him. We need to be invested in the character. So just take a rough, simple example, right? Um, for example, like let's say in an action movie, right? So the hero uh, is carrying a gun and things like that. Anyone vaguely familiar with firearms of, of course knows that uh, guns have limited ammunition, right? You run out of bullets eventually. So if during an action scene, uh, we keep on seeing the hero firing the gun without ever reloading, right? Infinite ammo. So that means uh, we, we sort of subconsciously, we can uh, understand that the hero will just receive whatever tools from the writers to solve whatever problem the hero will encounter. So we are no longer involved and it's not, not so exciting anymore. So uh, we always have to introduce some stakes and this comes from the rules, right? Back to the original uh, definition. 
plots and consequences. We need to know what is or is not possible. And because we know what isn't possible, then we know what the character can or cannot do. And because we know that, we know what are the constraints and what, uh, yeah, what are the consequences if they fail. Right. So the example that the SEEX, one of the projects that they worked on was the movie Saw. And uh, if, you rem if you remember that movie, or if you have seen that movie, right, it's about Chris Hemsworth coming from a different planet. So the idea for Marvel is Saw is actually um, supposedly gods in North mythology, but it turns out that they are visitors from a different world, different plane. So they consulted physicists to come up with a plausible sounding idea on how could that could this situation be possible, right? So we are not coming up with new ideas. Scientists, uh, this is not an original scientific idea or things like that. This is an existing intellectual property from Marvel Comics, but we bring in the scientists to try to make it uh, more plausible. So the idea is of course wormholes, and uh, in that movie. So the story goes is that uh, Sean Carroll consulted on this movie and uh, he said that, well, it's possible through wormholes. And, uh, but it wasn't called wormhole in Thor because it sounded a little bit boring. So they used an uh, older name that we no longer use, the Einstein Rosenbridge. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's not always, so you see, right? Uh, Sean Carroll is fine with that. Our job is not to make sure everything is 100% accurate or scientific, scientific accuracy, but uh, it's to help, right? And just to, to create an illusion of possibility, and that is good enough, okay? So, uh, and also, um, yeah, another example, Agent Carter was, uh, Clifford Johnson consulted on the TV show Agent Carter, so there's one episode where uh, the character is, Suddenly, he sort of become like a ghost. He is unable to touch solid objects. So, uh, so the explanation that Clifford tried to give is that uh, uh, it's something so like quantum states and things like that. So, yeah, it's like doesn't make sense, but you know, illusion of possibility. And also, most of the times, right? Every time you see in movies, right? There's a like a black box filled with equations in the background. So I guess most of you will try to like recognize what are those equations. It's probably supplied by these people, right? Like Clifford Johnson, and things like that. So yeah, now for like examples of specific types of stories, like how uh, how do this works? Uh, so I will give two examples: robot stories and then the wormholes. And the wormholes will involve the interstellar part. But firstly. Uh, robots, right? So, how did robots, you know, the idea of robots existed through literature and is, is also relevant in science and technology nowadays. So, and why are we, like, why, do, why are we always fascinated by robot stories? So, uh, yeah, Asimov, uh, yeah, Asimov is famous for coming up with robot stories. So, the idea is that, you know, uh, Every like for every new technology, right? We always have a fear, like nuclear weapon, we fear nuclear war and things like that. And then now everyone has smartphone, so you see like older people complaining that kids nowadays always smart smartphone that kind of thing. So uh, every time we develop a new technology, there's always some kind of inherent fear. Uh, but for the case of robots, right? Uh, what robots is because you know robots is we are creating ultimately is we are want to create almost copies of ourselves. So, uh, you know, we feel that what if we created some uh, robot and we are unable to control. That's why uh, we always make jokes about robot uprising, right? Skynet in Terminator and <laughs> things like that. So this, right? And uh, so, yeah, so that's, this is why the robot stories are very compelling. And uh, I should mention Frankenstein because uh, Frankenstein is what most people consider to be the world's first science fiction story and it is written by Mary Shelley so uh, it is, yeah, so the Frankenstein book itself speaks to those fears and uh, the story for Frankenstein is that there is a scientist called Victor Frankenstein so that's the name of the scientist, not the monster so he created uh, this 
being uh, from parts. And then uh, what happened was he sort of, once he created it, he got freaked out and was so scared of his own creation and he, he ran away from the land. So because of this, right, uh, this being is not a mindless zombie. It, can, it has feelings and this Frankenstein monster feels abandoned by the creator. So the lesson, if there is any from that book, is that you know we should take responsibility from what we create. So yeah, then uh, since then, right, we have all these stories from Terminator to the Matrix, where artificial intelligence becoming smarter and smarter, and one day they will become smarter than us. So they enslave our race. So yeah, I was struggling to remember the uh, Asimov Shilohs, but they are, old, they are over here. So uh, Isaac Asimov contributed a lot on this robot story. So I was I was saying just now, right? Uh, his idea was if we were if we fear these things, right? If we fear robots to rise, and if we don't want this to happen, then we should implement safety measures. And so uh, he wrote a series of short stories where robots existed, but they are implemented with these laws. So robot may not injure a human being or allow human being to come to harm and then uh, and then robot must obey orders as long as it does not conflict with injuring human beings and it must protect its own existence if it does not contradict, contradict the previous two laws so it's very interesting because there is a hierarchy within the laws if we want to break any law we must not break the higher ones so that is uh, that is what his what he proposes to implement into robots if we were to create these things. So, uh, and then artificial, so related to robot is artificial intelligence, right? So uh, these are relevant today because there are research happening now and this is how we start to see science fiction coming into the, the wording and terminology of actual science research. So suppose that, uh, yeah, this paper about AI and how could the three laws of robotics can be implemented. Right. So, started off as science fiction stories, not very serious, but uh, as robot technology becomes more and more relevant, then we, we start to use the ideas that was, that originated in science fiction in the first place. So, another thing just to mention uh, is that the uncanny valley. So the reason why we are fixated with robots, right? Because we are creating something that are supposedly copies of us, but doesn't really look exactly like us. So the result is these things are creepy. So uh, this is why early animation movies, right? Like Polar Express, when we watch it, people say there's something wrong with it, right? We, we, are, we feel uneasy by looking at these faces. They look like human faces but still unnatural, so it looks creepy. So, uh, and then, so all this thinking sort of influence design principles of uh, animation characters and games and things like that. So, and again, why Pixar is successful and popular is that uh, to we avoid uncanny valley altogether, we make, we design animated characters that do not, totally do not look like human faces. Uh, by the way, I just uh, realized, I, uh, do, do you know what is the uncanny valley? So uncanny valley, right, is like, um, suppose you draw a face or a robot, right? Uh, supposedly, the more it looks like us, then the more realistic it gets, right? But if we, if it looks, so it happens that, uh, it happens with a lot of people, if we see a human face that is not 100% like a human face, like a fake, it looks fake or plastic or things like that. It kind of looks creepy. And that is the uncanny valley. So uh, uncanny valley is like a graph. Uh, creepiness versus 100 accuracy to human face. So uh, when it is not accurate to human face, right? Uh, it's not creepy, it's cute. Mickey Mouse, you know, Goofy, Donald Duck, right? But, so the closer it gets to 
approximating a human face, right, the creepiness factor starts to uh, increase. Or the inverse creepiness is a valley. So the closer we get to the human face, the less appealing it is. Until you go back up into the 100% accurate depiction of a human face. Right? So uh, I guess people who play video games in early 2000s to mid 2000s will understand what I'm talking about. Right? The plastic face that doesn't really look human and looks weird and looks a bit off. So, uh, yeah, so that was the robot story. So, the next one is like uh, another genre where science fiction and science overlap a lot is about space. I guess, perhaps unsurprisingly, right? And in particular, the topic of wormholes. So, the idea of wormholes is actually interesting because it didn't start off precisely as a research area or a genre of science fiction, but it ended up to be involved. So it's weird because wormholes, right, started off as an exam question for a module in, in Caltech. Yeah, in Caltech. So uh, Kit Hong was the lecturer for GR, for, uh, for the module of relativity, and he set an uh, exam question. And uh, so one of the exam questions is to ask the students to interpret one particular metric, you know, solve Einstein field equation and things like that. And it turns out to be, now we know today to be a wormhole. So, and then also, during, around that time, right, uh, astronomer Carl Sagan was writing his novel Contact. And this is a science fiction novel for which he wants it to be as realistic and accurate as possible. So, he asked Kipon at the time, and uh, he, he asked him whether is it possible for what is the most realistic depiction for a potential method for space travel, right? Uh, if we don't want to use spaceship and things like that. So suppose there's an alien civilization that is advanced enough, right? They have, uh, have a lot of resources and they can build whatever they want. How would they space travel? So uh, yeah, so this idea was floating around Kipton's head already, and uh, he. He gave the solution to Carl Sagan, and he finished writing the novel, which later became, uh, which later was adapted into a movie. So once all this happened, right, uh, the first paper of Wormhole is on a education journal. This is a uh, American Journal of Physics, which is mostly talking about education and uh, you know how we explain things to students and things like that. So not a forefront research paper, but on education. But then it is interesting now because the, since he thought about this, right, uh, the question that he addressed in this paper is how can we have a traversable wormhole? So, uh, of course, we can always solve Einstein equation to connect two distant points in space time and things like that. But is it possible to use realistic uh, matter and material and masses to build a wormhole that? a human can traverse within a reasonable period of time. So the condition he gave for this paper is can be traversable within one year. And the speed, if yeah, the, if you travel then less than speed of light, can we go through the wormhole within one year without the wormhole collapsing? So that is another condition. The wormhole must be stable. So he did this calculation, then uh, he come up with some reasonable numbers in order to have a wormhole. So, <clears throat> Since then, right? So since then, uh, it sort of gave birth to this uh, research area for wormholes. Where until today, if you Google or type wormhole in archive, you get a lot of hits. So uh, yeah. So this picture was uh, taken like three years ago. That's why you see all these years in here. But today, you can still see a lot of papers. So this brings us to Interstellar, and uh, Interstellar. It, everyone is familiar with that movie, right? It's a movie where, uh, which involves a wormhole. So the story goes that uh, in the near future, uh, Earth is dying. Uh, they are running out of food and overpopulation and things like that. So humans come up with a plan to travel to find a new planet because they discovered a wormhole near planet Saturn. So they sent a, a spaceship with uh, Matthew McConaughey and Anne Hathaway 
into the wormhole and uh, what, come, what they find after coming out of the wormhole is a black hole and orbiting around the black hole are three planets which can be candidates for a new home from, for human society so yeah so that is the setting for this movie and this picture by now is probably iconic this is a picture of an accretion disk around a black hole so the reason why it's all circular like that is because of gravitational lensing the light coming from the opposite side of the disk was bent around the black hole and reaches our eye so all this matter is actually from behind the black hole but the gravitational field is so strong that the light can bend around and reach our eyes so uh, Kip Thorne, right, the one who wrote the paper on wormholes in the first place, he, uh, he consulted Christopher Nolan to write this script. But this is the part where I will start to complain. In the news, right, everyone proclaims that the interstellar is so accurate and so scientifically advanced that it resulted in actual research paper. That is kind of a misconception. So uh, some websites or news articles, they claim that this is the first image ever generated for, for a wormhole. That is not true because uh, we know this picture from the 70s already. And uh, so, uh, of course, back then, right, computer technology is not that good. So, uh, the picture doesn't look as sharp as the one in Interstellar. So, the research paper that Interstellar came up is more on the technical aspects in creating the image, more like the you know computer graphics point of view. So that is how, that is that is the research paper. It's not uh, coming up with new science and things like that. But in any case, uh, we this is the so this is see the same thing right? Accretion disk around a black hole. The slight difference is that this black hole is a Schwarzschild black hole, so it's non rotating. But for interstellar, they do it for the rotating black hole. But between this and today, right, there are other papers that uh, created similar images for all different types of black holes as well. So, back to contact a little bit. Uh, con for contact, right, uh, it's wormhole and it involves alien civilization. And uh, the idea for contact is that it, the story in contact is where a group of astronomers they listen to radio signals to look for signals of alien civilization. That is actually a real program that existed for a while, which was called SETI, S E T I, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So, uh, so uh, contact sort of like uh, spurred this research a little bit, and uh, I guess as of today, uh, this SETI research is is being phased down um, yeah, from last I hear but people are still I, I, I guess now the program is like crowdsourced so what they have is that they have a radio telescope in the US they collect all the signals but uh, they crowdsource to, to the public so that they can run in the computer background to help analyze the radio signals so if there is any you know, unusual signals that could possibly come from aliens then this is how we might try to find it then another thing, uh, another idea from science fiction that leaked into research is Doctor Who, so the TARDIS. Uh, this one is nothing much, it's just the concept of the TARDIS, right? It's very famous and known to, to everyone, so the terminology sort of like being uh, adapted into, into, to describe various things in research as well. So if, for those who are not familiar, right, Doctor Who is a TV series in uh, the UK. Uh, I guess it holds the record for the longest running TV series. It existed since the 1950s and is still going on today. So the story is about an alien, which his name is called the Doctor, and we never know his real name, but he travels around this police box. So uh, the idea is that the police box is bigger on the inside. So if you go, if you enter, right, you enter a huge room, which serves as the spaceship. So the idea for the TARDIS is that it is something that is bigger on the inside. Then uh, because of this idea, and because it's so culturally uh, relevant and well-known, then when we discover new space times and metric, we named it after the TARDIS, the TARDIS space time. 
So TARDIS and Doctor Who, right? Uh, T A R D I S is 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 an acronym for time and relative dimension in space. Yeah, but now we sort of like don't have. We just call it TARDIS. <laughs> So uh, then, okay, so now moving on to beyond science, right? Uh, the, the more important reason why scientists and writers interact a lot is more on social issues and policy and things like that. So I will mention this briefly earlier, right? Uh, you know, so society, racism, sexism, all those kind of things. And a lot of these things are touched upon by science fiction story. And why? Because science fiction, right, it always because the settings in science fiction story is always extrapolating or telling a society that is different from our own and because <coughs> because we because the settings are different from our own right then we have unusual things or things that are considered progressive by our standards so uh, you know having a minority race president female president and things like that and uh, so this is where uh, this is so because of this, right? Uh, science fiction story usually have all the role models and all the challenging new ideas that forces us to confront our own prejudices. So uh, one example is Ursula Le Guin, science fiction novel. She wrote a book called Left Hand on Left the Left Hand on the Left Hand of Darkness. Sorry. So uh, the setting of that book was. We, there exists a planet where aliens are able to switch genders. That, that is their biology. So uh, they switch genders after a certain amount of years. So because of that society, right, will it have gender discrimination and things like that? So stories like this can be explored through science fiction. And why science fiction? Because we can ask difficult questions through science fiction because we have no risk of offending people, right? Uh, for example, when we want to write a story, when we want to, when a writer wants to say something, let's say about religion, right? We can't write a story that takes place today featuring a real religion, right? That's that's very, that's not good, right? You shouldn't do that. But uh, you come up with a fictional society, or with a fictional societal system and things like that, so that it allows us to still have the conversation and develop and uh, to ask this question. So. Uh, in these pictures I put in, right, this is the screenshot from the movie Aliens uh, where Sigourney Weaver is the main character, so one of the rare female action heroes from the 80s. And uh, this is interesting because in the original Alien movie, right, uh, all the characters are written without setting the gender. So her character name is Ripley, just a surname. And when they cast the movie, right, they didn't, uh, they, they didn't really uh, decide on the gender until they chose the actual actor. So she was written uh, as a neutral. So it sort of gives a statement about equality, right? It doesn't matter whether you are man or woman, you know, we can still do the same thing. Everyone can do the same thing. Then, uh, so this is... Uh, Jodie Jodie Foster in the movie Contact, she plays uh, as she plays an astronomer involved in the SETI program, and her character is based on a real life person. Then uh, then on to like more uh, other other stories. This picture is from the TV series Firefly, written by Joss Whedon, and I put this in because uh, this couple right. Uh, Wash and Zoe, they sort of challenge the stereotypical gender roles of that we always have, right? Always the guy is the breadwinner, the woman stay at home, things like that. But for this couple, it's the opposite. So this guy, he can't fight, he is a pilot. He, whenever they go on missions, it is the woman, Zoe, who is a soldier who goes up and goes through all the adventure. And he is the one who stay at home. So, and this takes place uh, like a few hundred years into the future as well. So it's always usually the science fiction story that uh, you know makes us think about the different perspectives. So yeah, and uh, other things is like um, last example, uh, just a brief example is George Orwell's 1984. So this one is important because of, especially relevant nowadays, more and more relevant because of privacy laws with 
technology and things like that, right? So this, uh, so the reason why I bring this up is because of this book, George Orwell, uh, and the book is 1984. It is a story about a country that is a completely totalitarian society, and the government is in control of everything. So when a government is in control of everything, right? They will do whatever it takes to remain in power. So any dissenting voices, any um, any protest or anything is always wiped out immediately. So uh, this is important because uh, it is relevant today, right? And because the reason why it is that uh, if we look at, for example, North Korea today, it is very similar to what happens in George Orwell's 1984. And not just North Korea, but just any government, right? We hear any story like in, in Malaysia or in Turkey or in the US, whenever a reporter writes anything barely critical about the country's leaders, they will get arrested or executed or things like that. So, it's, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of things are being discussed today because especially in the US with, where recently where there's a NSA scandal right being revealed by Edward Snowden. So uh, yeah, so that is the so that is the idea that George Orwell was thinking of. But he wrote that book in the nineteen fifties and he practically predicted a lot of things that happens here. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say on this topic. And um, so this is the book I was. Uh, so yeah, this this is the book I'm writing to show you that I'm a writer. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, uh, yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not really promoting the book. Don't buy it. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Uh, it's an anthology of short stories, so it's not a science fiction. Uh, it's not science fiction actually. There's a one story that is vaguely science fiction. So uh, my book is about like uh, stories that reflects misery. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you published it in the process. Uh, hopefully, it will be published next year. Yeah, so the, the book is like there are uh, like contemporary settings and dramas and things like that. So how did you end up writing? Where you when did you start writing? Uh, some of the stories I written as a hobby long ago, and then uh, like because I have my friend who is also into writing, and then we sort of share each other's story. We sort of got into contact with a publisher, and the publisher surprisingly was interested in helping us publish. So uh, yeah, so then. Now, now here I am. If there is any, you know, interested people in the room who want to write, do you have any advice? Mm, advice is to just write. <laughs> um, yeah, because the main challenge I face, so that is actually something I really want to say. Is, uh, the, at first, right, I was interested in all these things, but I didn't actually start writing because I thought it would be stupid or, you know, people would laugh at me or things like that. But, it, uh, so, like, when, so to just write, meaning don't care about the rest of the world, just put down your ideas on paper and develop from that. And also, uh, yeah, also the first few things you write will suck and do not let that discourage you. Uh, I still suck, so don't buy it. Sucks. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Will you, will you consider writing science fiction in future? Sorry? Will you consider writing science fiction in future? I... Yes and no. Depends on uh, yeah whether I have inspiration or not. I, I did write a science fiction story uh, that is not in the book. It's a novel. So, uh, yeah, but it has nothing to do with physics. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I'm open to anything. Did you also mention the context of this quote? I don't think I wrote the next. Oh, thanks for all the fish. Uh, it's from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, I guess everyone, everyone sounds like they know, right? So, in the Hitchhiker's Guide for the Galaxy, right? Uh, 
Like the setting is like suddenly one day, all the dolphins suddenly escape from the water and flew into space. It's, it's a comedy book, right? And the last thing, and uh, the last thing that the dolphin said to us was, uh, "Goodbye, it's so long, and thanks for all the fish." Because the the dolphins are smarter than us. And they know the planet is about to be destroyed, so they go off first. Why am I the fish? Now you can finally give So there are other questions on behalf of the Physics Society. We are going to present Dr. Mark Wood, SDG Mark Thank you.